Okay, welcome everybody. We'll go ahead and start. Sange churam sogi churam la janchu padu dani capsuchi dagi churyan ki pe sonam ki rola penche sange drupa sho sange churam sogi churam la janchu padu dani capsuchi dagi churyan ki pe sonam ki Trolla penche sange drupa shum sange churum sogi chunam la janchu padu dani kapsuchi dagi chunyan ki pe sonam ki trolla penche sange drupa shum and letting the motivation connect. Okay, so we're on chapter seven, and chapter seven until the rest of the book is mainly talking about purification, and not just purification, but also the power of the mantras that we use in purification and accumulating merit. So that's kind of the, the shift that we're taking, not that it's radically different than the rest of the book, but just kind of orienting ourselves in it. Uh, from here on out, the emphasis is mainly going to be on purification. And when we're talking about purification and the power of different mantras, um, we started looking at this dependent arising and karmic connection situation with medicine buddha and how um the power of certain buddhas the power of certain mantras is related to the prayers they made while they were still you know regular people and bodhisattvas on the path and that sort of build up of momentum and the karmic connections they make at that point is then what we connect with as practitioners and why different things have different levels of power based on context so the provisor was always that all Buddhas are equal. All, um, yeah, all Buddhas are equal. All their abilities are equal, but our access to them and our connection with them is going to be varied based on our karma and based on the karma that they created as well back before they were Buddhists. So it's just something kind of interesting to sit with. It's in that category of extremely hidden phenomena. Um, some of it's just experimenting as a practitioner with what practices resonate with you the best, which you seem to have an affinity for. But I'm just wondering how all of that is sitting um, since our Medicine Buddha talk last week and just kind of as these ideas have had time to brew. Questions or thoughts about all of that kind of magical mystical side of things which has a logical underpinning but also a lot of it does rely on a certain amount of faith how does that sit with y'all oh good evening venerable um um well it's more of an observation that i um i've been saying mantras for a long time but i didn't have the depth of understanding about them that i've gained from the course and that really aug augments something in my mind and it's quite profound how i can change a negative state of mind very quickly with a mantra mm. or i can if i'm in bed spin cycling i can't go to sleep the mantra yeah. can get me to sleep I've never experienced anything like this before. It's really amazing. Yeah. It's the your energy. What? Your, your connection is going deeper. Very much so. But the power of these mantras is so um, tangible, to mm. so visceral. You know, so I'm oh. really, really astounded at the power that they hold i'm glad uh, you know and it's it, it's sort of like when you're doing a simple meditation like shamatha a single pointed concentration on something like compassion which is a concept you need a, not, a lot of analysis about compassion before you're able to hold the mind steadily and single pointedly on compassion 
You can't just say meditate on compassion, go, you know, you have to think about it a little bit and then you come into some resonance and then you can hold your attention there. Um, Similarly with mantras, it's kind of like you can recite a mantra and it has some sort of power and it has a benefit on your mind before you know what it means, just connection with the teacher, connection with Buddhism. But if you have some background, philosophy, logic, ideas, all kind of brewing back there, then you re-engage with it, I think, with just more energy and commitment, which means that the likelihood of the resonance is more. You know, it's like they are very powerful in and of themselves, but we're not ethnically Tibetan. We're not from Himalayan regions where we grew up with these ideas, where some of the practitioners have such deep devotion that they didn't need all of that context for it to have immediate power because they already had so much faith. And we need a lot of logic and thought from many different angles to come to that same sort of faith. And it's kind of not like a hierarchy of what's better or worse. It's just a question of what's going to make you deeply engage as opposed to surface engage, because the more deeply you engage, the more deeply it goes, you know. I I think it can sometimes even be like um, if you've ever done some sort of Eastern medicine that you have to take. And if you're sort of really wanting to take it, it seems to digest well. And if you're like, oh, it's bitter and gross Chinese herbs, quick, 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 you know, then sometimes it just runs right through you because there's some sort of resistance in your body that's like, I don't know if this is what I really want. So even if it's perfect medicine, it might not digest. Yeah, but when you have like uh, enthusiasm and connection and commitment to it, then it has a chance to work. So there's all sorts of things around the edges which make the powerful initial condition actually connect. And um, it's going to be unique to each of us, but I think study is going to come in handy regardless Yeah, in terms of deep engagement. And and some of the mantras, I do their sadhanas as well. Yeah. So I- I've had this years and years and years of doing it, but not having that next layer of depth of understanding. So adding that to the already energy built up, you know, it's noteworthy, really. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And um, I think sometimes at Tibetan Buddhist Dharma centers, we get introduced to Tantra very quickly, but then not a lot of context. Right. You know, we get a lot of context about right. the philosophical tenant schools or about karma or about the Lam Rim. And we know a lot of things, but we have had this Tantra thing lurking in the background all these years, not really knowing what to do with it, but knowing it's important somehow. So I'm glad that um, books like this recent one are coming more into our kind of sphere <laughs> at Dharma Centers. I think it's important. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. Other thoughts that are coming up, though, as we kind of dig into just see what happens if you do it because they're very powerful things or you know mantra as medicine mantra as protecting the mind things that have a logic but not necessarily the immediacy of the logic of something like patience if we have certain um deities that we mm, we don't have an affinity for um let's say tara who's mother and you know it, to me it seems like um so many of the lamas just are so in love with tara and so um if you don't have a mother who is powerful or you see as powerful mm. it's very difficult to uh for me anyway to to feel any um, connection with her yeah so i find that um, the more I know about Tara and the potential of Tara, potential of myself as Tara, that really helps. So that uh, what you're saying is um, applicable to me in that I need the intellectual understanding before I can make a connection. But my question really is, um, I'm I'm older, so I know the teachings about death and impermanence, and I think. I don't have a lot of time left and we don't know how much time I have left. And so should I be more um, focused on the the deities that I do feel uh, more connected to? Mm. 
Yeah, it's a good question. It, it's a really important question. And, you know, it's it's easier to be aware that death is coming as you get older. But I mean, you know, young people die before you, old people every day and healthy people die before sick people every day. And all of us should be having the same conversation in our head that you're having. And all of us should be thinking about what is the most efficient way to go deeply. The most efficient way to go deeply, while at the same time knowing that the Dharma path is a marathon, not a sprint. And knowing that, you know, even if we die today, what habits are we taking with us to our next life? What karmic seeds and kind of what's the trajectory we want to be in when we come into a new body? You know, what, what sort of do we want to carry with us? And so, you know, to answer your question about which deity and, you know, if you don't have an affinity with deities that are popular, um, you know, it can be a challenge sometimes because it might be that the most teachings that are accessible are about a deity you don't particularly connect with, but it's the one that the Lama is teaching about all the time. So it seems like maybe I should force it or give it some more effort or maybe just, you know, try a little harder because there is all sorts of commentary and resources and support around that deity. And if that feels like a discipline that makes you happy, like it will make me stronger and deeper to just put some energy into seeing if I can make a connection, do so. But if it feels like it's going to be a distraction and is going to dilute, kind of water down what you're already doing, there's no need to force it at all because all Buddhas are equal, right? So if you're feeling one touches your heart, just go with it, go deep and um, ask for the teachings that you want about it and search out the resources you need to support yourself with it. So our Dharma practice, I feel like always has to go in many layers. There's the layer that is you on your cushion, what you practice in your daily life that is kind of always ticking around in the back of your mind or in the forefront of your mind, depending, but it's always there. And maybe that's medicine Buddha for you, or maybe some other deity, or maybe it's a concept like just compassion. You know, as a concept, compassion is your core value or your way of orienting yourself in the world. And having like a very simple, specific point of reference in your practice for your daily life, I think is really efficient and it's really grounding. And then when you have mental space, you expand out and you kind of look around at other practices out there and see how you can weave them in at a speed that feels comfortable, at a speed that feels in resonance with your own learning style, but not ever feeling like you need to force it more of when you feel a curiosity or you feel, hmm, let's see, but not, oh, I should do this because this is on the list of things that Buddhists do. So I should, you know, if we put all that should, then it just feels like a chore and who needs that in your spiritual path, you know? So whenever I'm doing long retreat, the mantra I'm always telling myself and retreat other retreaters is your approach to the practice is as important as the practice. Yeah, your mentality towards it is as important as whatever it is you're engaging with. And so if you're coming to your practice with a happy, joyful, curious mind that has some discipline, is working on your laziness, but is not squeezing yourself, mm -hmm. that's a good approach. And if the approach is I should because that's what a good kid does or some sort of old story from the past or old socialization, then that's not the approach we want. Even if the practice is perfect, we've not made it workable because of the mentality we brought to it. It's so deeply personal. I appreciate your, your confirming for me. Um, I feel as though I've always needed to be very focused and coming to um, Tibetan Buddhism, it, it seems so big and so wide and so inclusive that mm -hmm. I've, I've been lost at times. Yeah. Um, and yeah. Um, having just gone through abdominal surgery yesterday, that was very um, re revealing for me, just preparing for it. Yeah. And um, yeah, so I really appreciate, thank you. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, I mean, amazing. You're in class after abdominal surgery. Oh, my goodness. Well, I am going to turn my video off. Please. Sure, yeah, lay back, put your feet up. <laughs> do what you got to do. Thank you.
thank you for your question. Yeah. You know, and re remember with all of these that, um, I mean, Tara is a really good example, you know, Mother Tara, whatever, is same as if you're doing the sevenfold cause and effect, seeing all sentient beings as having been your mother. What if you don't like your mother? You know, or what if your mother is not someone you aspire to be? You like her, you love her, but you don't want to be her for whatever reason, despite the inevitability of all of us becoming our mothers. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. So, you know, what you want to think about is what is the archetypal mother? Because that's the essence that you were really talking about, the archetypal mother. And the archetypal mother that is strong and grounded and unconditionally loving. And that archetype, you've met tiny flavors of in a million different people in your life. Whether it was your actual mother or not doesn't even really matter. It's the archetypal mother energy that we're trying to connect with. Yeah. So with all of these, similarly, it's the energy that they embody, not the kind of point of entry that maybe traditional Tibetans come into it with because they have a culture where mothers are often awesome. <laughs> right. My mother was an incredibly sweet and loving person and everyone loved her, but she didn't have, she didn't show her power. Mm. And that was difficult for me. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And then when we come across these teachings, we're sort of like, I don't know if that's going to do it for me. <laughs> you know? So think of the archetypal mother. Yeah. And, and again, don't forest it if you're feeling love for medicine Buddha, go that way or, you know, Manjushri or whoever. Yeah, they all embody all. So, it, yeah, any other thoughts about that whole category of ideas the karmic stuff the power of mantras stuff before we get into purification good okay so we'll start with Vajra's uh, oh, sorry yeah. um i have uh, thought about all these uh relationship and ship and um connection with the we could have with any of uh, this uh, mantra and uh, Buddhas. And I, I think it's um, each time that maybe it, it, it is a superstition or a greed that uh, comes because I know that, oh, this Buddha is for health, this one is for change in your life. And it, and each time I want something very badly, it doesn't come or it kind of um, uh, make me so agitated that uh, it, it, it's not as authentic as it should be. Because when I'm just open to it and I just recite like mantra of Tara and I don't want nothing because everything is quite cool it's very effective and I think it's it's important to for me to tell myself to remind myself that I I don't need anything from them only knowing that they are here to help it's and not something that I want to cling to it it works better Mm. Yep. Yeah. What is just a just a statement? Um, no question. Yeah, it's a, yeah. a statement, but I think I have it from you, but because sometimes I think you uh, passed this to me that we don't have to wanting something like as a result because it's mm. it's not about that. I mean, so it, just repeat it to, to yeah, know. Yeah. yeah, look, you know, it's 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 a delicate thing to have goals without expectations. Goals without expectations is a weird place to live. To have aspirations with no pressure, without a timeline, you know, to have urgency without anxiety, yeah, or without attachment. These these are delicate things for us in our practice and it's individual and it takes a lot of just sitting with and reflecting how do I have energy and momentum and a joyful goal 
that who knows how long it will take and no expectations on it or myself while still being invested fully. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's delicate. And it takes, I think, a lot of just joy in the process. And just, mm -hmm. I think all of us as little, you know, seekers on the path, there's a certain joy in just discovering things about yourself, about humanity, about reality, that are very enriching all along the way. You know, as I said before, it's a marathon, not a sprint. But it's mm -hmm. also the sort of marathon where you want to enjoy the scenery along the way you know, not just have it whip by, mm -hmm. enjoy the steps of it. And the more you're very present with each part of the process, then the better you'll be able to lead other people when they need you or when they're open to it. Mm -hmm. So it's also helpful, I think, to think of all of these topics from the perspective of what if I had to teach this someday to someone who was open to it? not prophetizing, not being missionaries, not teaching out of our depth, not going out of our lane, none of that. But sometimes your friends are in a space where they're open to hearing something about the Dharma that you do know about. But if you've never kind of articulated it, it can be kind of tangled and clunky. And you're like, look, I understand. I just can't say it right. Sometimes helping us study is thinking about how will we teach and so how would you explain it to your best friend who is in distress? Or how would you explain it to someone in your Dharma circle who is ready for that content? Because that will elevate your own knowledge of it and kind of clarify the doubts as well. So mm -hmm. it's also a good way of thinking about it. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so Vajrasattva. The Vajrasattva chapter is lovely and thorough. Um, it, you know, it has all the classic Vajrasattva things you would expect. So I thought to bring in just some extra side things um, that aren't in the book, just to clarify them. And then we'll also look at the book. So this is from uh, when we talk about mudras and hand gestures and things like this. This is from Robert Beer's book, The Handbook of Tibetan Buddhist Symbols. And it's just good to know that in Buddhist Tantra, the right hand represents the male aspect of method or skillful means. The left hand represents the female aspect of wisdom or emptiness or the wisdom realizing emptiness. So paired ritual attributes such as the Vajra and Bell or arrow and bow, which are held in the right and left hands respectively, symbolize the union of the active male aspect of skillful means with the contemplative female aspect of wisdom. So when we practice Vajrasattva, usually we practice the simple form, one face, two arms holding Vajra and bell, and that Vajra and bell representing that union of method and wisdom. But in Vajrasattva, strangely, you sometimes get this aspect, even for people without highest yoga tantra. You get the full Vajrasattva aspect, one face, two arms holding Vajra and bell, then embracing the mother similar to himself who holds a cleaver and a skull cup. And they're in union and it's quite full on. And this imagery can be very confronting and confusing. And yet it's offered up for even very beginning Buddhist practitioners as part of their Vajrasattva meditation. So this is a highest yoga tantra image, but lower tantra practitioners can use it because it's all visualized at the crown. So in this case, the female represents wisdom, the male represents method rather than the hands. And the hands of course still represent those things as well, but now it's kind of taking a more full embodied form. And then being in union with one another indicates that wisdom and method must both be practiced and eventually united. So that always brings this question of like, what is a consort and like, who is this partner? And this is from Robert Thurman in his commentary on the Tibetan Book of the Dead. So consort or wisdom mother, wisdom father refers to the partner, either male or female, but more usually female in a Buddha couple, such as Vajra Dhatishvari, Varachana's consort. So sometimes the father and mother in a Buddha father-mother couple are considered different divine beings, sometimes only the double manifestation of a single being. So despite there being two of them, they're considered one. 
so the Buddhist belief is that all beings, whatever their superficial sexual identity, are potentially both male and female. Each has male and female aspects and energies in his or her being. The empathic ability to transcend sexual identity habits is cultivated by tantric archetype meditation, wherein a male will meditate on himself as female archetype Buddha, and a female will meditate on herself as a male archetype Buddha, and both will meditate on themselves as male and female Buddha couples in union. So, you know, we know that there are like literal consorts that were human beings like Guru Padmasambhava and his two heart disciples, Mandarava from India, Yeshi Sogel from Tibet. These were all real human historical figures. These two women were his heart disciples who were also teachers in their own right, but they were also his wives. And that's a different context than what we're talking about in Vajrasattva. So when we're talking about Vajrasattva deity in union, we are talking about method and wisdom in union. And once you have the empowerment, if you were to see yourself as one of these deities, you're both. You're not either. You're not picking the one that accords with the gender you identify with. You're both of them. And all of this gets very like esoteric and confusing because we are so weird about sex in our society and we're so weird about gender identity and we get all kind of locked into these constructs. And then, you know, if we have some sort of... Um, broader social awareness, these images might look very heterosexist and very homophobic in some way. So we can bring in all of this stuff from society and misunderstand the point of Tantra. And I think that we do know kind of viscerally or intuitively that all of us have both masculine and feminine energy. That aspect that is kind of moving and skillful and out there and getting the job done and the aspect that is wise and spacious full of potentiality full of wisdom and that that's not the property of either gender that both genders have both qualities and sometimes what we seek out in other people is a balancing effect to our own seeming deficiencies but what we're really trying to achieve is that inner balance within ourselves as an individual so Tantra has all of these layers related to method and wisdom, masculine and feminine, but don't ever make it ordinary. Don't make it ordinary. Yeah, don't, don't get lost in the social constructs of our time. Those are all important conversations, but they are worldly surface conversations that are hopefully leading to things like less prejudice, less discrimination, more equality, more equity, all very important, but not what we're talking about with Tantra. Does it sort of make sense? Yeah. So, you know, I remember one time His Holiness was giving a, a five day tantric commentary in the Blue Mountains in Australia. And it was highest yoga tantra. And there was a lot of older students there, but there were a couple of older students that hadn't studied properly. And the figure that we were studying was Yamantaka, which is male aspect. And this woman raised her hand during one of the tutorials and she said, but I don't want to be Yamantaka. I want to be Vajrayogini, a female aspect, highest yoga tantra deity. And my teacher was the one doing the tutorial and he was, you could almost feel him like stopping himself from slapping his forehead. Like you've completely missed the point. <laughs> yeah. Like you're also not blue. <laughs> You're also not green, right? Like, why are you obsessed with the divine genitalia? Like you're identifying as a fully enlightened being. And the fully enlightened being that we're talking about has like 16 legs and 34 arms and all of these heads. And none of that looks at all human, nor should it. But you don't like that he's a boy? <laughs> like, he's also a buffalo. That's also weird. Yes, it was with me. You know, so it's funny that we get kind of lost in these forms. And then we get our, our like ordinariness all tangled and forget that the essence of Tantra is to purify ordinary appearance and grasping to it. And in order to purify ordinary appearance and our grasping to it, we need to visualize things that are radically different than how we identify. And the physical body is one of our coarsest, most prevalent places of grasping. 
So what better than to identify as the other gender or another color or two genders at once or any number of things. It just breaks down all of those constructs that we've built as a facade saying it's I. You know, when you were a little baby, did you know what gender you were? No, <laughs> right? Like at a certain point, it felt necessary and relevant. And that is all fine on the worldly aspect, on the worldly plane. But from beginningless time until now, we've been every gender, every race, every level of economics, every level of, you know, intelligence, every kind of species. We've been so many things so many times. We need to stop like locking into my body says this about me. Yeah, and even when you're doing non-tantric meditation, non-Mahayana Buddhist meditation, when you're just looking at the body as identified as the self, that's the first thing we're starting to work on breaking down when we're trying to realize the emptiness of inherent existence. So Tantra is really fascinating that way, but it can make you a little confused if you don't feel grounded first. So it's counterintuitive. It's like you need to know yourself really, really well before you can start challenging your identity. So, so questions so far, this kind of iconography comes up a lot more in highest yoga tantra, but for lower tantra practitioners, this is your first kind of like exposure to this deities and union image. And you'll see it even in like little tiny Vajrasattva pamphlets at FPMT centers. They'll say, here's your Vajrasattva purification practice, tiny little pamphlet. And you're like, oh, great. What are they doing? Yeah. <laughs> and you think, it's a bit soon for this, I feel. I don't know what they're asking of me. And then the monks and nuns are doing it. I'm so confused, you know, right? So now's your time to ask away. You might already understand these things and we can move on, but I just thought to make sure there was time. Yes, no, go ahead. I think the one thing that, I mean, I, I, I hear the words, but it's very difficult for me is, you know, you visualize that I'm both, I'm both the consort and, and I, and I, you know, I think it's just because I identify as a woman, I think, oh, I'm the consort, you know, I just, and it's hard to be both at the same time because we just don't, I just don't think like that in my daily life that so that I find the most hard, hardest mm. thing to visualize. Yeah. Yeah. And you don't, you know, you don't have to force it again and you can identify as one or the other it, or if both is too confusing, but like, say you're practicing Chenrezig Gawagatsa, which also is deities in union. Sometimes it can be useful to take the swap back and forth rather than be locked into the one that feels feminine. Yeah, and it's like the, the enlightened mind of all the Buddhas is manifesting in this way to convey something about utilizing the energy that accompanies attachment differently. And any number of things can be a catalyst for our attachment. And the, you know, the most strong one is some sort of sexual activity for a lot of people. And that's not an accident in the iconography, but the essence of what it's pointing to is how do you utilize the energy that accompanies attachment or the energy that accompanies anger? Not anger, not attachment. We're not using anger and attachment. We're using the, the energy that accompanies them because they're strong energies and they're out of our control for the most part at our level. Like once you're like boiling mad, it's very hard to not like let it take over. When you're really, really obsessed with something and your desirous attachment is really activated, think of something like food even. Just once it's like activated and you've like anticipated the cheesecake waiting in the fridge for you and you say to yourself, wait till tomorrow. And you're like, no, but it's right there now. And then you have this whole struggle and then off you go, like you're going to eat it. Yeah, you have to like throw it out the window to stop yourself from eating it once the attachment has been engaged. Yeah. So what if you were to use an energy that powerful to benefit rather than to harm? It's, it's a powerful thing. So when we're looking at like the dynamic of the couple, I think it's helpful to understand what a Dakini is or what a wisdom mother is. And what's also confusing in Tantra is there's a few words that get used 
in the same way and in different ways and it's very context related and that makes us confused so one is consort or wisdom mother one is dakini or kadro sky dancer and one is goddess plamo and those three kind of women for lack of a better word divine women are different things or the same thing depending on context and that is also exasperating <laughs> Yes, it's very exasperating. So um, Jan Willis uh, just wrote a book, and uh, in one in that book, there's a really excellent chapter about what is a dakini. So I pulled out that little section because I think it will help. So um, I'll read that and then um, tell me what your question is after that again, because it might help. The book is called Dharma Matters, Women, Race, and Tantra, and I really recommend it. This is just a tiny section. She says... Dakinis are said to be beings that are tricky and playful. The term is thus sometimes glossed by translators, translations like sky dancer or sky enjoyer. They are often described as wrathful or semi-wrathful deities, though it is also recognized that they may have human or other animate or an inanimate form as well. In some contexts, they are termed demonical beings and witches. One scholar seemed to like to call them furies, others have referred to them as sprites and fairies. They have been called the genii of meditation. For tantric adepts, they are viewed as messengers or prophetesses or protectoresses and inspirers. Additionally, they are at times regarded as rikmas or mystic consorts. And most inclusive of all, without, within Buddhist tantric contexts, Dakini is viewed as the supreme embodiment of the highest wisdom itself. Embracing such wisdom, one becomes Buddha. So what are you embracing? You're embracing wisdom, the highest wisdom. That's the real embrace. So Jan says, I believe it is the latter sense of Dakini. That is the embodiment of the highest wisdom and the symbolic concretization of the direct, unmediated, and non-conceptual experience of voidness that makes the term so difficult to discuss. For in the ultimate, absolute, and final sense, she stands for the ineffable reality itself. In a tantric universe replete with symbols, Dakini, one may say, is the symbol par excellence, and being preeminently, constitutively, and inherently symbolic, the Dakini always remains a symbol within the tantric symbolic world. As such, she serves only, always only to represent and suggest, even for the tantric adept, other and deeper non-discursive experiential meanings. Inevitably then, she remains elusive to academic or intellectual analysis. And then there's a number of footnotes which you can read later, but when we're talking about like modern day Dakinis, we usually talk about Kadrula, right? And Kadrula is celibate, despite the fact that she um, has lay person attire. She has the, um, in the tradition of Marpa, celibacy vows. And she also has these like wrathful aspects where she's the oracle of the deity Seringma and she gives advice to his holiness. And then she's like this sweet fairy princess, like blessing the sea creatures with prayers and mantras. And who is she really? What is this energy actually? And this is really important to sit with. So one way of looking at the, the consort or the dakini or the goddess is to think in terms of like, what's a reference we already have before we were Buddhist? What about the muse? the muse that artists talk about, writers and painters and potters and all forms of artists talk about the muse as what inspires them in their creativity and in their movement and their engagement with something more than the ordinary that they were working on, the inspiration factor. So the inspiration factor is helpful to view as personified. And of course, because we're talking about any religion that has existed more than a hundred years, the main figures who held it will have been male. 
because patriarchy, yes, we know. So if the main figures what have held it have been male and most men are heterosexual, then of course they're gonna personify this inspiration factor as something they find cute. Yes, so we can take that with a grain of salt, but touch the essence of what has been conveyed. It's that spark that makes you engage with your creative mind and your inspired mind much more deeply. So take that like feeling of inspiration and like creativity spark, and then take what you understand about the wisdom realizing emptiness and put those two things together and say, okay, it looks like this. Let's just use that and not reinvent the wheel. But that's what we're talking about. It's not really the form. It's the wisdom realizing emptiness plus the creative spark, the muse. Does that sort of help? Yeah, actually, that helps a lot. And also what sort of somehow cleared my mind a little bit is, you know, you had the she in quotes or Jan Willis had the yeah. she. And I just realized, oh, my God, it's a label. Like, you know, it's, yeah, yeah. it's, you know, it's just a label on collection of qualities, like you yeah. were saying. And that phrase, you know, embracing highest wisdom, like, in that in the union it's it's so that yeah i mean all the pieces are floating around in my head but it's yeah there's a you know and I, again we come back to these merging ideas in tantra all over the place mer this merging with that we're merging with that right the buddha merging with your concept of the guru now you have guru hyphen buddha the guru hyphen buddha then merging with you as the deity you merging with like merging and merging and merging and merging even though nobody's mind stream becomes anyone else's mind stream, you know? And so we know these things about the way the mind works from minds and mental factors and from Sutra. And then we go into this whole Tantra universe where it seems to be paradoxical and you think what, but you can't merge that with that. Those are two things, <laughs> you know? And again, in Tantra, it's about adopt the attitude that that's the case don't worry about the fact that it isn't. Adopt the idea that that is the case and see what happens. So it's it's so much relying on your creativity, Tantra. And it's so much relying on your ability to stay very grounded, while at the same time, very exploratory. And very, you know, kind of in this mind of an artist that hasn't gone mad, you know? So that combination of grounding and creativity needs you know good sutra grounding otherwise when you go into the tantra side you become a bit of a nutter but if you only do the tantra side you can become amazing wild creative but also totally groundless in a way that makes you lacking practical common sense you know so you need both Thank but it, one does sometimes seem to contradict the other and that is um part of the fun <laughs> yeah yeah, other, uh, other thoughts about the union iconography or wisdom mothers and goddesses and dakinis, which are sometimes the same thing and sometimes not at all the same thing, but they're all words that you will hear floating around in Tantra. Um, so in the chat, there was the, I have a hard time with wishing to visualize, to see the deities in union, although I understand the purpose intellectually. How to over overcome the resistance to this visualization? My own personal opinion is don't worry about overcoming the resistance. Just see the single deity. Just see single Vajrasattva. Right hand method, left hand wisdom. You know, it's still method and wisdom combined. I guess what we need to understand is that even the lower Tantra deities, their counterpart is implied, even though not explicitly drawn. The counterpart is always there because we're always uniting method and wisdom in Tantra. But the, it's full on iconography and it's very confronting and it can be triggering. It can be it can creep you out. It can make you whatever go into all sorts of places that are detrimental to your practice or just distracting. So if that's the case, just like put it on the back burner and see the single deity version. 
Yeah, don't force it if it's not coming. Yeah, um, it's just that the question arises, can I practice Vajrasattva, mother and father above the crown of my head before I have the empowerment? And this is the one special case where yes, you can, despite it's a despite it being a highest yoga tantra deity, people without the empowerment can practice visualizing the both of them, if you want, but single deity is completely fine, and good and powerful and works just as well. Yeah, Anna, go ahead. Since we're talking about sort of this highest yoga tantra deity, I have a confession. Three years ago, I did receive the empowerment, but no explanation. And I do the practice and I'm at that stage. I would love to really understand it. Um, could you suggest a really good book where I can start sort of peeling back and get a deeper understanding and a deep dive? Of highest yoga tantra or of vajrasattva? I had the actual, the highest yoga tantra initiation. Mm. So you both. <laughs> so both. Yeah. 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 Um, for understanding highest yoga tantra practice of succession guru yoga, the book Succession Guru Yoga by Serme Kenser Lozong Tarchin. There, May Kenser, Lozong Tarchin, only available in hard copy, only available in hardback, but worth the investment. That's going to sort you out quite well because it goes through all of the bits of that practice, paragraph by paragraph. But that's not for those of you without highest yoga tantra. It also goes into the Bodhisattva vows and the tantric vows in a lot of detail. So it's an excellent text. Um, there's a really great book um, about Vajrasattva. Um, which is okay, I think, for everybody, really. But um, let me just look and see if I can find it before we dig into anything else. Here it is. Okay. It's called uh, Vajrasattva Meditation, an Illustrated Guide. And it's by Kempo Yeshi Punsok. Kempo Yeshi Punsok. And that is a really, really excellent text on Vajrasattva. Thank you so much, Venerable. I have yeah. to say, I'm learning so much just by being here and it's demystifying a lot of the things. Um, yeah, I'm of that variety. Received things, but I don't understand them. Yeah, you're like, I don't know what happened. Seemed great, but now what? <laughs> now what? <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, so I'll, I'll write those in the chat and um, let's go ahead and have a five minute break and then we'll do a little bit on Vajrasattva and then just do the practice. Okay, <clears throat> excuse me. So we'll do a little bit of uh, just quick review of Vajrasattvas for opponent powers, which I think is fairly familiar to, to most of you. And then we'll just do the practice um, in its gentle form. And um, next week we can do a slightly longer one, but we'll move into 35 Buddhas fairly swiftly. That Vajrasattva chapter is really nice. I really recommend you have a good look at it, but I'm guessing most of it will be pretty familiar to this particular group. Um, so anyway, just briefly, we'll go through them. So purification, um, for any method of purification practice to be complete, meaning it renders the negative karmic seeds unable to bear the fruit of suffering, the four Pona powers must be included, even if not explicitly in the practice. Uh, for fully qualified meditations on emptiness, these four are less emphasized as that level of purification is more direct. So if you've realized emptiness, of course, your purification abilities are amazing. But before we realize emptiness directly, we really, really, really need the four opponent powers. Then we remember emptiness to reinforce it, to strengthen it. But because it's, um, you know, not realized, it doesn't have the same oomph. So in the, in the chapter, they're calling the first power the power of dependence, which is the same as saying the power of refuge. Then we have the power of regret, the power of remedy, and the power of resolve. So, first one. We basically just visualize and then set a motivation. So you're visualizing Vajrasattva easy to visualize, one face, two arms, left hand holds a bell, right hand holds a vajra, seated in the vajra position. You can do just a regular refuge in bodhicitta prayer, 
um, the most important thing is to really connect deeply with what it is you're depending on. You're depending on your integration of the Dharma to protect you from suffering. You're depending on the Dharma to show you, you know, what is right, what is wrong, which of course, you know, even before you were Buddhist, but you're strengthening through your understanding of Buddhism. And you just take a minute and really be with refuge while visualizing the representative of the refuge. And so when you're visualizing, whether it's clear or not, you're just having a sense that the enlightened mind is here bearing witness with total compassion, total acceptance, total love, in no way is judging you harshly for your mistakes. Really have the sense that the Guru Buddha is just so pleased that you have self-awareness. They're just so pleased you're taking a moment to self-reflect and look at what negative habits are in your mind. So never feel like this is kind of a punitive thing or like a I don't know some sort of vindictive god or scary priest in the confessional or whatever vibe is going to make it feel oppressive really manage that background baggage you might have and feel like this is a compassionate gaze bearing witness so then we go to the power of regret so you're just scanning through the 10 non-virtues yeah just a quick scan and you think, okay, physically, what have I been up to? Verbally, what have I been up to? Mentally, what have I been up to? And we want to think of physically, verbally, and mentally, all three. And it might be the same one keeps coming up every single day, and that others of them rarely come up. But we're experiencing effects of habits from the past that we might have gotten up to many, many times, and the tendency might still be there. So kind of checking in with that. So sometimes it can be helpful to think of the killing non-virtues, or excuse me, the physical non-virtues as acts of taking, you know? So what have I been taking that wasn't offered? Have I been taking life? Have I been taking possessions? Have I been taking people and bodies? Have I been taking things that are inappropriate to take? Because that can kind of trigger a good confronting feeling of, oh, that wasn't mine to take. Yeah, the bodies of those animals, the, the possessions of those people, the relationships or the people or the bodies of people, those were not mine to take. Those were negative. And then the verbal ones, you could think of kind of different ways of breaking, right? So lying, you're like breaking trust. And divisive speech, you're breaking relationships. And harsh speech, you're breaking safety. And idle gossip, you're like breaking time that could be used in productive ways. So there's a lot of different ways to view these, but what's going to make them really feel the harm that they are? you know, to really touch you and not just kind of flick them off as no big deal. And then the mental ones, you can think of what are my ways of fabricating? So covetousness, you know, how am I embellishing and seeking and craving and building up some object of attachment? How am I fabricating the object so much so that I've given it all of this power and I say I need it for my happiness? And what is the fabrications of ill will or hatred or anger? How am I building up the person that I'm so enraged at and making them worse than they actually are or their actions more directed towards me than they actually are, et cetera, et cetera. And wrong views, how am I fabricating on top of certain ideas or distorting or twisting proper ways of looking at the world? How am I engaging my ignorance and making it worse? So you don't have to frame them in this way, but that can be a ha helpful way to kind of assess what have I been up to today? What have I been taking or breaking or fabricating? Uh, how have I used my body? Have I, how have I used my speech? How have I used my mind in ways that don't help my physical or don't help my physical verbal and mental engagement of the Dharma? What are ways that I'm harming myself and others through my body, speech, and mind? So you're just generating the power of regret, seeing a fault to be a fault. 
And, you know, the specifics, I think you all know, but killing is taking life, stealing is taking what hasn't been freely offered, and sexual misconduct is taking someone's recognized partner or cheating on your own. And then there's a ton of elaboration and variations within that, but those are generally what we talk about. And lying, of course, is intentional deception. Devices speech is intentionally dividing others through either truth or deception. Harsh speech is intending to wound with your words. And idle gossip is lacking positive or uh, or kind of equal intention. It's it's lacking, it's lacking purpose, really. It's purposeless. And then covetousness related to attachment, ill will related to hatred, wrong views related to ignorance. So, you know, however you break it down, it's just an invitation to self-reflect. And then we get into the remedy, which is your countermeasure. And so you kind of re revive your visualization of Vajrasattva, and then you add the mantra. We can just do the short one tonight and maybe the long one at other times. Om Vajrasattva Hum. So visualize Vajrasattva, say Om Vajrasattva Hum. And then if you've got the mental space, you can make it that more active visualization. So Vajrasattva is above your crown. He sends down streams of light. And as he sends down streams of light, you can either break it into body, speech, and mind visualizations or use the same visualization for all three. But uh, the first one is like um, gross blood and pus and disgusting gross things are being flushed out or like scary creatures that um, trigger repulsion are getting flushed out, or just kind of like black smoke soot is getting flushed out. But the main idea is you're flushing the system clean from the crown of your head all the way down and out through your lower doors. And that all of the gunk then uh, goes down into the earth and uh, satisfies the Lord of death. And then the earth closes back up. So you can think of this kind of like scary finishing visualization, or you can just think all of that gunk dissolves into space. And then at the end, you can think receiving blessings and getting filled up with light. So there's those three. And then the power of resolve is just a time-specific promise to oneself and the Guru Buddha Vajrasattva about what one will refrain from in the future and for how long specifically. And think in terms of something physically, verbally, and mentally that you're going to work on and how. When you're doing all of this, I think that it can get really beautifully routine. Um, and if it's a nice, beautiful routine, the danger is that you kind of take it for granted and it gets too routine and you just kind of go through the motions. So the main thing is to make it really personal and specific. Um, personal and specific, really viscerally real, very tangible, very like in your face, in your life. So when you're doing the power of regret, do try and think about like just today, what did you get up to? Yeah. But it might be that today, not so bad. Yeah. Today, quite good. You know, helping the sentient beings, not getting up to too much trouble. So you might have mental space to like, think about, mm, okay, so how about last year? last decade, last couple of decades, are, is there stuff that kind of weighs on me that I know was not my path that is eating me? Yeah, and whatever you can do to kind of shift the energy of that being like a heaviness or a point of identification. We really want to shift the heaviness of our past mistakes. And that doesn't mean you're not taking responsibility. It just means you know better, you would do better now. And everything dependently arose. So don't, you know, hang on to that feeling of having been like bad or something. It's not helpful and it doesn't make you any better in terms of behavior. There's no need to identify with it. Let it go. Clear it. So, so those four opponent powers, they come up a lot, but did you want to ask about any of them before we do the practice? Clear enough? Sorry, I have... I have a question. When you sure. say um, um, make it personal, 
uh, it means that you you use the like day to day life uh, actions of yourself to when you are doing Vajra Sapa. Is yep. it? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Yep. Totally. And when you do the power of resolve, make sure you're not um, overestimating your abilities. Otherwise you get um, sort of a disappointed feeling. So if you have been really divisive today, you know, you were really bad mouthing someone and it wasn't like under the heading of processing and problem solving, it was actually, let's really get into how they're horrible. And um, I hope they agree with me and let's separate people. You really did a bad divisive speech thing. Don't say to yourself, I'm never gonna be divisive ever again, because you'll forget. Say, I'm not gonna be divisive tomorrow and really be on top of it tomorrow. You know, And you can be mindful for that day about the habit of divisiveness, and then you really achieve that purification and that changing of energy and momentum that led up to it. But don't, you know, don't kind of set yourself up to fail and say, oh, I'll never do that again. And then in three weeks, you do it and you feel terrible and disappointed in yourself. You know, do small, manageable goals. Um, how to make the brief reflection on emptiness at the end more lively the object, the action, the agent. Um, when you think about emptiness, think about dependent arising as your access point to emptiness. So the object that you did the negative action towards lacks inherent existence, why? Yeah, and so say, you know, you got really angry and you said a mean thing to someone on purpose, you meant to hurt them. You think they are empty of inherently being the bad person deserving of those words. And you think of all the reasons why or some reasons why. And then you think the reason I said that is from many, many reasons why. So it's not like giving yourself excuses so much as giving yourself context of if I hadn't been so tired, if I hadn't been triggered, if the karma hadn't been there, I wouldn't have said that. I did say it, it needs to be purified, but I don't need to identify as it. And then the action being harmful is also empty of inherent existence because it dependently arises. It's harmful because of our society says those words wound, we've been trained to believe them, the tone, the affect, all these things came into play. But if I'd just been watching those same words or they had just been watching those same words in a movie, it would land differently. None of it is one thing in and of itself. So you're allowing that kind of spaciousness about every part of the drama so that you don't cling to the story. So that's a way to kind of make that emptiness meditation a bit more visceral. Yeah, Christine, go ahead. So then our young ten, during the regret part, um, what is what is the best motivation? You know, I'm doing it because I'm scared I'm gonna have a lower rebirth. <laughs> like especially yeah. for like the really heavy things that I'm very conscious yeah. of in my past. And I go, and then I think, oh, the, then not the hurt the people I hurt, but then I go, but it's all empty. So what, what is the best? You know, you see what I'm but I'm really doing it because I'm scared. Yeah, yeah. And that is uh, an accurate first reason. Okay, I know, but it seems accurate. like it might be a better one. And then you take that reason and you expand it, right? So, What's we the do expansion? Think, yeah, you expand it and you think, okay, the reason I don't want to be reborn in the lower realms is yes, because I don't want to suffer, but also because I can't do any good there. I'm going to be hurting too badly. I'm going to be too distracted. My own mind is going to be tormenting me. So, who can I help in that way? right? Or if I'm lucky enough to be reborn as a human, but I have all this suffering, sometimes we have the mental space to transform suffering, but sometimes we really don't. So we don't want so much suffering that we can't concentrate. It's going to interfere with my path, right? How will I benefit anyone if I'm just consumed with my own pain? So please let me purify the causes for pain because I need to be at my best for sentient beings. That's better. one way of kind of like taking, yes, you genuinely don't want the pain, but there's bigger reasons to not want the pain than just it's not comfortable. It's how will you be in this world if your mind is dominated by those things? So more bodhicitta. Yes, exactly. Bodhicitta exactly. motivation. Always bodhicitta, but I think the fact that you don't want the pain of the negative action is important, right? Like, don't skip over that step and pretend to be more altruistic than you are. Like, let the fear of it touch you. Like, even just as simple as I don't want to keep doing the same thing over and over again. 
you know, never mind the lower realms or a difficult human rebirth tomorrow. I don't want to be having this heaviness of having slipped off my path or the sadness of having hurt people, you know, just tomorrow, you know? Yeah. That's, a good you know, I don't want to keep living this way. Yeah. Break the okay. habit. Yeah. Okay. So we'll do the short version of the practice. So a nice straight back. And just be in contact with your physicality for a minute, just grounded. And visualize Vajrasattva above the crown of your head, radiant white made of transparent light, seated on a lotus sun and moon disc, holding Vajra and Bell. One in nature with your own guru. Absolutely aware of every mistake you've ever done and absolutely compassionate in his gaze. And then adding the refuge prayer, I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By my merits from giving and other perfections, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By my merits from giving and other perfections, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By my merits from giving and other perfections, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. And so generate the power of regret, recognizing a fault to be a fault without guilt or identification. So identify your mistakes and negative habits physically, verbally, and mentally, what has not been your path, but you slipped into today. And then visualize that from Vajrasattva's heart center, a stream of white light pours down. Clearing those mistakes of body, speech, and mind, rendering those negative karmic seeds impotent. And then add the mantra. Om Vajrasattva Hum, 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 
Om Bhadra Satvam. And then making a time-specific promise to oneself and the Guru Buddha Vajrasattva about what one will refrain from in future and for how long specifically. Think in terms of something physically, verbally, and mentally that you're going to work on and how. And Vajrasattva then dissolves into light and absorbs into you. And then add rejoicing, positive actions that you've done today, that you think of other people maybe having done today. Strangers doing positive work, all sentient beings, Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. Just spend a minute recognizing the positive, increasing your merit.
and then dedicate. Jantu Sanchorim Poshe, Make Panam Kiguachi, Kepan Yampa Me Pai, Gone Gondu Kawasho, Tony Dawarim Poshe, Make Panam Kiguachi, Kepan Yampa Me Pai, Gone Gondu Kawasho. Okay. So thanks everyone and um, I'll see you on Thursday.